So Michael has had such a varied career that I, I printed out what I was going to say about him and ended up at two pages. And, that's <laughs> what, and that is, it's way too long, but just let me say, he started out in the 60s as a, uh, with a PhD in theoretical physics and did that for some amount of time and then moved on to any number of other challenges, including certain artistic work I read that you've done. And, I, and of course, in the last 20 or 30 years, it appears that you've been very involved in the internet and the effect that the internet is having on our attention spans. So with that short intro, I think we'll, I'll just pass it on over to, to Michael. I am really looking forward to this presentation. Well, thank you. Um, and that's nice to see you all. There, there's one thing I know about you right at the moment, since I haven't um, met most of you. Uh, that is, I know that you're paying attention. If you're not, uh, then this would not be as a, uh, a way for, there would not be a way for you to contradict that. Um, so what is paying attention and what is going on here? Um, we can explain that in various degrees of complexity, but uh, let me just start by saying what it would be from the viewpoint of some sort of um, engineer, uh, um, information specialist, if you like. Um, what happened is I'm thinking relatively familiar thoughts to me, uh, which then I put into words which are mostly familiar, but not entirely familiar. And um, those go into sentences. The sentences uh, then somehow get transferred into vocal signals and also the movement of my mouth, as you can see on the video. And uh, the, so sound waves and, and light get passed on to the computer in one way or another. And there they get sampled and digitized, not necessarily in that order. And then uh, they get turned into packets. They probably transfer from being electrical signals or digitalized electrical signals into uh, light waves that pass through uh, uh, fiber optic cables. Excuse me, I have not turned off my phone, so I will have to do that right now. But uh, um, anyway, so uh, I hope that doesn't keep going. Um, Anyway, so those signals then go along through various different channels all along different uh, cables of the internet into eventually the servers of Zoom, wherever those servers may be, at which point they get sent out to each of you. And similar things happen, of course, with your pictures coming to me and so on. But um, when they reach you, your computer or whatever it is you're using to, to watch this, what happens is that uh, it gets retransferred into sound waves and, and visible, visible images. They've done a very good job about that. But uh, um, that then enters your head in some ways. But in order for you to be paying attention, something more has to happen, that is, uh, you have to uh, turn the words and the sentences back into thoughts. Uh, and so they become your thoughts, even though they were originally more or less my thoughts. Now, when I say they're your thoughts, I'm not saying that you will automatically agree with them, but in order to agree or disagree, you first have to understand them. And so that's the way that this is not simply the passage of information. There's something else going on, namely, um, my mind must influence your mind. Uh, I develop a certain control over it. And if, for instance, I think about, I, I happen to mention words like ping pong, a hippopotamus, yogurt, or joy, uh, all those will have meanings to you that are you know, not really known to me uh, because they'll be highly individual in different cases. Um, and you weren't planning to think of those things, but nonetheless, they've entered your mind in one way or another. And also things like joy or ping pong may well have bodily uh, experiences for you um, that mean that I not only in that sense have some control over your mind, but also your body. 
And uh, that is quite interesting. Um, and it isn't what has been researched very much attention. If you look it up, for example, in Wikipedia has been the object of psychological research for probably 150 years uh, in laboratories all over the world. And, uh, but they focus on things like how you react to the sound of a buzzer or different words in each ear. They don't involve paying attention. They don't involve the dyadic process of one person paying attention to another. And that has not been in my, uh, at least superficial study of it, very well um, looked in, at at all. So uh, it's, it's a huge area because everybody does pay attention. Um, and, and the fact that so little is known about it or thought of, or even studied about it in, in somewhat formal ways is, is a very interesting fact, I think. Um, but let me say more about than what happens with attention. Uh, it's intrinsically limited. And if I can figure out how to share the screen here, um, let's see. Um, let's see. Uh, I am not exactly sure how to share the screen at this point. You, uh, um, if you have a PC at, at the bottom, uh, it should show a, a okay. green. Okay, like, uh, here we are. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, let's see. Um, this, this is uh, a summary of just, some just of a minute. The, just a minute. The screen is not being shared. Oh, it isn't. Okay. <laughs> Whoops. Okay. After you press shared screen, choose the one you want to share. Oh, okay. Okay, there we are. Sorry. There we um, go. Thank you. Okay, so these are some words that involve attention um, in one way or another. Um, and you can see from this how vastly important attention is for us, for human beings especially. Um, um, if you look in the upper part, you see being commanded by, uh, which uh, if you're in the army, you're told attention and then you're given orders and then you're supposed to follow those orders. That's all part of paying attention. In less strict ways, if you're serving somebody or waiting on them or caring for them, if you love them, um, looking sort of around, uh, it can involve a whole host of related things in all of which you have at least to be paying attention to be able to accept, regard, recognize, respect, any one of these other things. And in the upper right, I have put hate, um, just to point out that negative attention is also attention. Um, you know, people we, we truly despise uh, or even mildly dislike also get a degree of attention. So that, for example, um, one thing I learned years ago when studying this was um, if you are, I am now going to stop the sharing and get back to you. If you are, um, if you happen to be a serial killer and get arrested and uh, jailed, you will find apparently very commonly you get tons of fan mail um, and offers of marriage and all sorts of bizarre things that you wouldn't think anybody would want to give a serial killer. But the fact of the matter is, uh, for whatever reason, which I won't go into because it's just speculation, people are fascinated by monsters uh, in one way or another. Um, and obviously we can think of, you know, examples like uh, Hitler, Mussolini, uh, Stalin, and so on and so forth, who we know very well, uh, or probably know uh, considerably for their misdeeds and horrors, but nonetheless, we all know who they are, and we all know something about what they did and said, and so forth and so on. 
So uh, in all those cases, uh, there is some kind of attention that, that flows even in the negative case, but mostly people prefer or want a positive attention, I think. Um, but uh, let's see here. Okay, and uh, just a second. Um, let me see. Uh, I don't know. I seem to have. Have I lost you? Your Zoom window may be behind something else. You can click on your Zoom icon at the uh, on your bar at the bottom of your screen, usually, and that will bring you back to us. Um, well, it didn't, but <laughs> okay, wait a second, here we are. Okay, sorry about that. Um, anyway, so uh, attention is highly desired. And also because it involves somehow controlling both uh, your um, both your mind and to some extent your body, uh, you can't pay attention to obviously to unlimited numbers of people. You have to uh, choose who gets your attention. And that means that attention is not only desirable, but is scarce. Um, and let me point out that um, in addition to all the ways of getting attention, which people can like, we're all mammals. All mammals have to pay some attention to their young at some stage of their life. Humans have to do that to a much greater extent. Um, and no infant could possibly survive without getting attention. That's the only thing they really have any ability to get directly. And um, even as they develop other abilities and learn to talk and so on and so forth, they still are entirely dependent on getting attention from some kind of older person or adult. And if they don't have that uh, in the first few years of their lives, uh, at least they will, they will die. And in fact, uh, for most children, it's necessary to have attention for, for quite a few years before one can even conceivably give that up. Now, most people don't want to give it up. Uh, we are social beings. Some of us have an extreme antipathies to, to getting attention because we've learned we can be shamed, we can be criticized, we can be um, possibly in a dangerous situation, etc. So some people, uh, perhaps because of, uh, to some extent, their own genetic background, are fairly averse to getting attention. But most people, if they can get it in ways that are not uh, threatening, will want attention. So what we have is a situation that something is highly desired and yet is also scarce. And so um, let me again risk trying to leave the screen if I can. Um, and um, let me see here. Okay, let me try this again. Um, uh, you reached 510. Whoops. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, attention goes to a, the whole gestalt of a person, uh, but let me skip this um, and talk about attention as an economy. Now, um, you you all are familiar with the term economy, but it's really hard to find out what an economy means in general. So I've come up with my own definition. It's a system of interconnections or exchanges that motivates its members and comes to dominate their lives uh, because they desire what is scarce 
and come to compete for it. I, I'm sure there are many ways in which that's an inadequate definition, but it's, it's one that um, nonetheless is, um, it, here we are back again, it, it is uh, somewhat evocative at least of, of what an economy has to be. But let me point out that in most of human history, this economy wasn't very much in effect because people lived in tiny communities for the most part, uh, tribes or uh, villages where you could more or less get enough attention. Uh, obviously, even there, people competed for it. If you think back to grade school, for instance, uh, you probably remember there was some competition for attention and even a small class of 30 or so people. Um, and, and that has remained um, a minimum degree of competition that has existed. But then as we go through history, uh, at first, the, the maximum way to get attention was simply to shout very loudly or something like that, make some noise perhaps in some other way. Um, and, and you see that in things like Greek theaters, which are set up um, so that people can hear as best as possible. But even then they had to have choruses and so forth. After that, came, or simultaneous with that, perhaps came writing, either phonetic writing or ideograms that allowed people to get attention um, well beyond their own lifetimes at times, but uh, still not very many people wrote or tried to write or, and not too many people read. And so that went on for a long, long time that even if you lived in a city, you lived in a small neighborhood in the city for the most part, you could get attention from many of your neighbors and they would know you and so on and so forth. So there wasn't a tremendous competition for it. Then slowly you get into the more modern world where you have things like printing. And then it goes on uh, uh, for several more hundred years before you get things like railroads that allowed, for example, Charles Dickens to uh, travel around the US and give readings in various places. And after that, uh, a sort of explosion occurred uh, towards the end of the 19th century. Uh, you had phonograph records and then motion pictures and then radio, and then not too long after that television. And all those things of course became more and more um, fancy and for example, color television and so on and so forth, satellite television, which connected the whole world. And then from that, you eventually get um, to the internet, which connects billions of people to some degree, even back in the 90s, it was doing that. Um, but it wasn't completely easy for you to get a large audience until social media were developed. Social media, things like Facebook, Twitter, um, Instagram, uh, TikTok, and many, many, many others uh, are perfectly designed as instruments for competing for attention in a certain way. Because uh, oh, what you can do is uh, see exactly how many friends or followers someone has. You can see, uh, you can like something and it becomes known that it was liked and that and especially with most of these media you can share that is you can take somebody's statement and pass it on to your own friends or followers and in that way you get attention and they get attention too and so it becomes incredibly easy to begin to broadcast to the world if you're at all lucky um, and of course many people do this with nothing more harmful or dangerous than, you know, pictures of cats or, or the food they ate that day or some such thing as that. But others, of course, try a little harder to get attention. And um, it's often possible to do that in, um, in ways of explaining uh, what is, or, or rather, let me go back there. It's often possible to get attention essentially by saying something striking and different. And that striking and different thing can be utterly false. It can be, um, 
it can be insults, it can be any sort of thing that um, connects one to many others. So um, we let me give the example of, of uh, scientific facts, for example. Um, if you say something that everybody knows to be true, you're not going to get much attention for saying it. If you say something that is novel and bizarre, you can get a lot more attention for it. Um, and so that comes up against the fact that science is quite difficult to understand in general. Um, scientists are always making provisional statements that they then can change. They're using uh, language that is highly technical as a general rule. Um, and supposedly one needs an advanced degree to understand much of it. So most people are left out. So therefore it's a wonderful opportunity to say something that doesn't necessarily follow from science. Uh, if, you, if you use anecdotal evidence, which would be largely discarded by scientists, for example, um, you can come to extraordinary conclusions. Um, so science is one example of something that gets uh, easily challenged and distorted uh, as we have seen in the recent vaccine case by, um, by simply people who have no particular expertise speaking over the internet. Um, Sometimes they're right wingers in the case of, um, let's say the vaccines, but very often they are, um, even in that case, there's somebody like Robert Kennedy Jr., for example, who's a, a, a very outspoken a, a vaccine opponent and, um, and others like that. So they, they come from both sides. So that's one reason that it becomes entirely um, significant to um, to seek attention by means of distortion in the case of science and in other ways. And then, of course, the more bizarre the, the claim is, the more it's likely to be passed on through these media. It's so easy to do it um, and added to in some cases. So for example, consider QAnon, which arose during the Trump administration. Nobody knows who Q is, but he or she um, continues to make statements that combine a certain rationality with a lot of oddness. Um, for example, one of the QAnon statements that's pretty fundamental is there's a reason for everything. That in fact is probably true. There, in some sense, there's a reason for absolutely everything that happens but these reasons are not correlated or necessarily connected or anything of the sort. Uh, that's a subtle point that, that followers of QAnon tend to ignore and they look for meanings behind random events or complicated events. They believe that they are exercising many of them what they consider their own critical capacities to come up with new explanations for all sorts of sort of stray facts that they try to put together. And, uh, and in addition to that, of course, there is the amplification of, for example, everything Donald Trump said. Um, and Donald Trump is an example of a fairly common phenomenon in the world today, which I believe has something to do with the internet. Um, he tried to, to just stay in power by quite illicit means, but he's not alone in that. There are um, a host of people who were first elected, legitimately elected, uh, Erdogan in Turkey, Modi in India, uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil, Duterte in the Philippines, uh, who all were elected because, and to some extent, they thumbed their nose at, at the, the more civil authorities that had existed before. And then once they take power, uh, they try to hold on to it by rather illegitimate means, increasingly so. So Trump was one of those people. Um, and so the politics that we have today is increasingly a politics that gets influenced by 
uh, things that are just spewed forth over social media. And um, that's very difficult to combat that there, there, are, uh, there are lies and all sorts of lies and to, to simply say, well, that's a lie is not going to work very well because it's something that people want to hold on to because it gives, uh, gives them sense to the world increasingly. I would emphasize one other thing that um, I think has been exaggerated by social media um, even more than it was before, but it, it has to do with something that um, in our society has become uh, overly used, which is supposedly meritocracy. Uh, which is the idea that if you have an, a, a college degree, you're better than somebody who doesn't have one. And so uh, that is partially said, established by uh, you're getting more attention uh, in certain circles, but it's also um, becomes a, a just obvious way of behaving. If you happen to be in a human resources department in some corporation, you choose the person with the degree over the person without the degree. And, and that's in many cases, a minimal thing that you have to have to get certain kinds of jobs. And what I think that has done for a lot of people is to increase the sense that they're shut out and not listened to. Because um, if, you, if you look at the stories that people tell, it becomes increasingly common that let's say you're, you're a very good worker in some factory or something like that, but you have no degree, some young person who has just gotten an MBA or even just a BA in business, let's say, uh, gets more attention than you do. And, and not only that, tell, ends up telling you what to do. And you then see that repeated in common media. Um, and I think that helps lead to the antipathies that somebody like Trump was able to use. Um, so I've circled around and talked about a number of topics. Um, perhaps I'm finishing a little earlier than I expected, but I'm sure, well, let's see if there are questions. Um, I'm, I'm about done with what I had to say. So um, if there's something I need to explain in more detail or, or another question you have, please let me know. If I may ask, uh, do you have any solutions to to these problems you've you've just covered? Well, you know, for example, in the last one, I would say the obvious thing is to be more sensitive into how people are shuffled into um, into categories, um, and um, for example. Um, people who who do get uh, business degrees or something like that uh, should be taught to really be respectful to the people that they are supposedly going to manage. That would be one simple partial solution. None of these are going to be very easy. The other thing that has struck me is that um, and even democratic politicians are, are very uh, amiss in my view in that regard is that um, basically uh, it's very easy to try to attack, attract attention for your candidate by saying some very exaggerated sort of statement and political consultants love to do that. And to too great an extent, it seems to me, uh, the politicians go along with that, which leaves them in effect being highly insincere and viewed as insincere. And I do think sincerity is not going to solve everything by any means, but I think it's extremely important that we do try to be sincere if we're interested in engaging in any kind of dialogue with people who might have disagreements with us. Um, 
And that sort of sincerity is hard to maintain. For example, on Twitter, it's very easy to go overboard and laugh at somebody or complain about them, not take them seriously as a human being if you disagree with them. So even people who, whose general positions I follow or, or even my own self, it's very easy to overdo it in terms of uh, making somebody look stupid or, or foolish or something like that. And so I think those things are things to avoid. I'm but, going to- uh, Margo had a question. Okay. Argo, do you want to ask your question? And unmute. Do you want me to ask my question? Oh, um, I was wondering, um, um, I've, I've always felt that categorical welfare, for example, and the kind of categories we use are really, really bad. Um, it, it avoids hum, humane solutions. Do you have anything else you'd like to discuss about categorical um, ways of looking at people? Well, I mean, I do think that, you know, it becomes a sort of um, fallback position that is very easy to categorize people in all sorts of ways. And of course, as you probably are aware, many of these categories are things like racial categories, age categories, um, or gender categories that put everybody in one pile or another pile. And, and my sense is that uh, as uh, children uh, grow up, they go through a period of intense categorizing to understand the world. Uh, but it's important to get out of that and go beyond that and realize that there are all sorts of shades and that many of these categories don't really apply to um, to individuals. And so the problem with that, of course, is if you have limited attention, giving that attention explicitly to an individual who you want to uh, reach is, is hard because you don't have enough capacity to do that for everybody who you might want to get pay attention to. So categorizing is a way of simplifying paying attention, but it's a wrong way. Uh, it's, it's very hard to avoid. And you know, similarly, the idea that we should regard every human being as both needing and, and deserving of attention um, is, is a kind of goal that is very hard to um, maintain or hold on to. Um, so I think uh, we can try to do that, but it is, it is coming up against the fact that we, we don't really have time. For example, if you're walking down the street and see seven homeless people, are you really going to give them the attention that they, that you can almost tell that they actually need and would love and so on and so forth? I must say, I'm very, very bad at that, but, um, I think we can all agree that if we try to be equal about attention, that would be better. Um, one thing I, I think is, is very much the case is that we can't, for example, have the government say, um, you all have to pay attention equally to everyone. We just wouldn't do that because it's too hard and and conflicts with what our own desires are too much. So I do think there's no way to have a perfect world in, in, in that regard. And it's, it's a growing shame and it's a growing problem that I don't see any solutions, easy solutions to. Thank you. Uh, Don has a question and, and then uh, Audrey after Don. Can I go ahead with my question? Uh, Don got in first. Don, you in on mute and ask a question? Yes, I uh, wonder why you think uh, people tend to be more attentive to bizarre things. Uh, what is it about bizarre or unusual, or as you mentioned, even the brute that draws our attention 
um, in competition with those things that are not that way? Well, obviously they're novel. <laughs> That's the first thing. If you, if you say something that, that most people just accept as true, if you say the sky is blue or, or uh, something like that, nobody's going to want to share it or, or quote you on that because everybody knew it to begin with or thought they knew it. Uh, if you say something like, actually the sky is not blue, it's more of a deep pink, and uh, the reason that we think of it as blue is such and such, um, that may be quite unconvincing to anybody who has thought of, at all seriously about why the sky is blue, but at the same time, it's something new, it's something different, and, and what's new and different captures our attention better than something that we already know. Um, you know, there's a well-known phenomenon of, of uh, traffic on the freeway slowing down when there's an accident so that people can rubberneck as the term is. You, you want to see, um, you're partly attracted to something awful in a certain way because that could be you perhaps, or it might be somebody you know, or perhaps it's just so unusual as to be uh, in itself, again, a novelty and interesting. Um, you know, if somebody is uh, bitten by a shark, that's more interesting than if they just tripped on the sidewalk and hurt themselves that way. Um, so I think we are, we are drawn to the novel, to the different, to the, um, to some extent, perhaps we, and this is conjecture that I probably don't have any right to make, uh, people to some extent have a, have a dark side that, uh, you know, every child at some point or another says, I want to kill you or something like that. They don't really mean it or they don't really know exactly what it means. But some of us hold on to such feelings in depth and, uh, you know, I just, I have a friend, for example, who's in his uh, late 80s, and uh, he, he's, he's told me that, you know, if he, when Trump was president, that if he could have, he would have gone to Washington and assassinated him. And, you know, uh, I think there are many people who might have had similar kinds of, of uh, longings, uh, simplify the world by doing something really bizarre or horrible. So I think there are lots of reasons why, I mean, for example, to, to give a completely different kind of case, horror stories. I will never read a horror story. I, I don't want to be horrified. Um, but a lot of people, or horror movies or whatever, a lot of people love those things. Um, and uh, they want to have the intense emotion for the same reason I won't go on a roller coaster, I think. Uh, but many people would love such a thing. And so I think people have different kinds of emotional reactions that need more or less um, sort of massaging. Uh, and, and that's one way to get it. But if it is only the matter of being novel, Mm -hmm. then we could be drawn to a, 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 an essentially humane act. Somebody is a hero or, or is a physically uh, competent, like Simone Biles or yeah. LeBron James or a, a singer. Oh, or, or well, I, we are drawn to those people, or many of us are anyway. I mean, uh, I don't know what your politics are, but if you think of somebody like... Uh, AOC, Alexandria Octavio Cortez, she, she uh, has a very humane views, if you happen to like them at least. And um, so she wins office, she gets elected. And, and so it's not just the bizarre negative that gets followed. For example, one thing that I haven't talked about uh, some of the positive things that come out of social media, I believe, have been um, a great enlargement of the Black Lives Matter movement or the Me Too movement, for instance, both of which you can think of as beneficial, depending upon your take on them. 
but um, they work because uh, people um, basically uh, want to do the right thing. And they become, when they see the wrong thing, what appears to be the wrong thing through these media, um, they get uh, very eager to turn things around. For example, uh, I, I don't know how many of you follow Twitter or enough to notice, but there was a case uh, last summer, I guess, of the Central Park bird watcher who was a black man. And he happened to have a video camera with him or on his phone, I guess. And someone uh, was letting her dog off leash in the bird sanctuary. And he asked her not to do that. And she called the police and claimed that he was threatening her um, with violence, presumably. And that created an enormous stir, um, which ended up perhaps uh, overdone that uh, she lost her job uh, at some financial firm or something like that uh, because she had essentially acted in a racist way to, to just claim to be right when she basically wouldn't put her dog on leash. So there are many cases where, um, you know, we virtuous things of, or perhaps even overdone virtuous things happen as a result of, of social media, but they may not have the same um, negative effects as some of the things I've been talking about, but one can hope that they end up being more positive that, for example, uh, people who, who are famous, probably some of the ones you mentioned, uh, have have shown themselves getting vaccin vaccinated and that helps other people get vaccinated because they want to follow the stars they know. Audrey? In the, in the Times today, there was an article about the um, amount of money that was given to uh, people who owned homes that were affected by a, a severe hurricane several years ago. And um, one fam they both had uh, estimated the same amount of damage. And yet FEMA gave $17,000 to the owner uh, who was white of a house that was very near to another house equally affected that was owned by a black person who only got $7,000 for repair. And they s cited a couple of other examples where this was the case. Now this is a different amount of attention is given to different people or different houses. And it seems like discrimination to me. And I wonder if you have an, I could say something about this and what we can do to prevent it? Well, I think one, to start at the end, one way to start preventing things like that is to bring them to attention, which can be done through articles in the Times and also through, and, and the Times at this point is a sort of social medium in many respects, as well uh, as our other newspapers and so forth. So when they do investigative re reporting and, and report on uh, probably very long-standing racist reactions. Um, as you may know, here in Berkeley, uh, it's recently come to light that the reason I live in the hills and the reason the hills are s s zoned for one family goes back to racist views at the beginning of the 20th century. And people just had those views very commonly and they were not challenged. Uh, similarly, I've just been reading a book about misogyny and one of the things it points to, which I think is fairly well known actually, is that um, social um, sociologists have, have uh, prepared uh, resumes of, of people um, that are switched between male and female names. And what has been shown is that people who are possibly interested in hiring someone like that have a much more positive view of the male name 
than the female name with exactly the same resume. Um, and of course, similar things would happen based on race. Um, so we have lived in a, I mean, all of us I, I, that I see here are old enough to remember the civil rights movement. Um, you know, obviously things have improved. And I think also, um, as far as I am aware, sexism has been reduced sharply, both racism and sexism, but there's a very long way to go in both cases. The, the um, overwhelming reactions of all sorts of people who might claim to be utterly unbiased are just the sort of thing that FEMA mentioned, but, uh, or, or that the Times mentioned about FEMA, but, and it, you know, the average, government worker can easily uh, be quite racist, especially if they happen to be in the South or something like that, but, but really anywhere. And you know, we all know that there are numerous cases of that. So I do see that there's something good about calling these things out and it's happening a lot more now, as far as I can tell. Um, that's what one can do, one can say, Look, you may not have intended it, but this was racist, or and um, you know that is one possibly good thing. I don't know to what extent it is derived from social media, but it does seem to me that uh, you know when such cases are brought forward, they get a lot of attention on social media, and and that is a good thing. So uh, Margo is asked, uh, do you think that social media should be regulated? Um, I don't know how exactly. Um, I mean, I don't, I think that as they're presently constructed, for example, take Facebook, which I know something more about than others. Uh, they have a very complicated set of algorithms which determine which of your friends get into your view and you're likely to see. And they do that on the basis of trying to sell advertising um, because they figured out fairly early on that it's only through advertising that they can make any money. Now, if you could imagine a public utility like Facebook that didn't need advertising, um, they could have different algorithms that were much more sensitive to uh, the kinds of prejudices and injustices that get automatically um, amplified on the current version. So I do think that's a possibility, but at the same time, a lot of the possible regulation would not strike me as being very feasible or, or look very good. Um, I should add though that there are, Google and Facebook and other things tend to be more regulated in other countries, such as in the European Union. So there may be some kind of regulation that that would work and, and would imp improve things. Um, to, to be fairly specific, uh, a lot of the hateful stuff that gets on uh, an organization like Facebook gets on, rather gets on Facebook and gets passed around through these algorithms uh, is very detrimental. And to some extent, the people who put it on there understand the algorithms pretty well and know exactly what they're doing so that it gets passed on to as many people as possible. It gets visible in their feeds as it were, and that could be changed. Charles, I believe, has a question. Yeah, uh, Hillary asked the essence of my question, but I'll elaborate it on a little bit. On the one hand, I think that the ability to send hateful stuff around simply because people like that kind of stuff is terrible and we need to regulate it tremendously. But on the other hand, I really believe in freedom of speech. And if you try to set up a committee or an algorithm to regulate it, that can get bias too. Can you see any practical solutions of some kind of 
regulation that you know automatically say senses the level of hate in a post and doesn't post it or you know, I don't know how you do this but if you got any bright ideas well I don't know how bright they are but um, again one of the things I would point to is that the algorithms that Facebook has set up to maximize uh, the interests of advertisers uh, also tend to promote some really hateful things because they get likes and so on and so forth. So I think probably many of those algorithms could be slightly changed so that the hateful stuff didn't get quite as much exposure. Um, but I don't know any of the details of, of that or how to do it. Uh, what I would suggest is um, what seems to be most practical is calling out the hate. Um, that is other people saying, look, this is a horribly distorted message. It shouldn't be out there. In other words, fighting free speech with more speech uh, in effect but doing so in a way that is uh, designed at least to capture a good amount of attention, which, which may be hard, but you know, if, if we think of the horrible example of um, the killing of George Floyd, for instance, the fact that somebody was um, uh, taking it, pictures of it while it was happening and, and broadcasting them essentially live, I believe on Facebook, I'm not really sure right now, uh, made all the difference in what happened in that case at least. Um, so it involves people being aware and being conscious of the fact that um, hate is uh, a real, um, <clears throat> hate is a real phenomenon that does exist, that many people feel hate or, or, or desire, for example, white supremacy, which amounts to the same thing, um, or, or anti-Semitic or whatever they may be, uh, to acknowledge that that happens in the world and that we need to call it out, um, I think is all I can really come up with at this point. Yeah, complicated, but thank you. I believe, uh, Margo, you had another question about cultures. Uh, you have to unmute yourself. Uh, I was wondering about if, if people in different cultures pay attention to uh, novel things, or is this a, our culture? Well, um, you know, I haven't really, I'm not an anthropologist and I haven't done cross-cultural studies very carefully, but let me just say uh, my impression, which is, uh, you know, things which um, get attention through novelty are actually quite noticed throughout the world. Uh, now, obviously there's, there is some sort of contradiction there in that um, some cultures have very strong uh, value systems that dislike novelty at home. Um, I'm reminded of the story that goes back to, um, I guess, something like 12th century Europe that Roger Bacon, who invented uh, glasses, uh, was supposedly jailed by the abbot of his monastery because it was novelty and that was not accepted. But uh, if that, it's not even clear whether that story is true, but uh, what it goes to point to is that certainly in highly traditional cultures, there's a tremendous weight placed on holding to that tradition, which I think is also true in certain parts of the US more than others. Um, you know, and we all have traditions that we want to hold to, I think, or things that we value that we don't want to change. But at the same time, uh, the same people who hold to those traditions supposedly 
watch a lot of internet porn or something like that. Uh, so they're not um, actually as immune from uh, wanting novelty as they might pretend to be. Um, Audra, you have to unmute yourself. You have to unmute, please. Can't hear you. Well, one of my friends worked on the um, Peregrine Falcon issue and the uh, big um, bald eagle issue w that were affected by DDT. And what he found when he investigated this vulture business in India was that there was a, um, a medication that we actually take, us humans over here in the States, um, that was being given to the cattle to protect them from certain diseases. But, but as you know, um, cattle are not eaten. They, they are allowed to die and they're used for milk and yogurt and things like that, but they die. And then the vultures take care of the carcasses. So if the vultures become extinct, then there is no mechanism there for the removal of the carcasses of these dead cattle. So it became a very serious issue to them to stop the extermination of these um, vultures. And I think that after a years of, of pressure from us and from the United States and from um, um, my friend's communications that they did ban the use of this medication for cattle. Now, I don't know if the vultures are reestablishing themselves, but it, it really did knock it back and it was pretty serious for them. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that's interesting. I mean, there are thousands of ways that, uh, you know, people strive to get attention for all sorts of things and have obviously for quite a long time. And one of these things is certainly how animals are affected by human beings or how the climate is affected or whatever it might be. Um, I don't know any particularly uh, significant way that, that one can do better in that. Um, I think, those of us, I mean, it turns out to go back in a little bit before the internet, uh, many of us uh, as very young people were affected by the Disney movies about um, wild animals, which were highly scripted movies in certain ways. But uh, one of the things they did do is increase um, awareness of nature to a tremendous extent. Um, and since then, there are the Richard Attenborough movies and other such things. Um, these are all incomplete, but uh, we do become more aware of parts of the world that we don't exactly see through such media, and, and they do make a big difference. As you may know, uh, in the 19th century, um, in, in the U.S., uh, all sorts of uh, animal populations came very close to extinction or, or did reach that in the case of, for example, the passenger pigeons, because there was absolutely no sense that they deserved to live or anything like that. And so that has changed in, a, in an odd way through, through the acts of Walt Disney, who had other less desirable characteristics, but, um, you know, by trying to get attention for something like that, he, he ended up making a huge difference. Um, and that can change. I mean, uh, there's a big debate, for example, in this country about what animals should be in zoos. Um, in many places, elephants, for example, have been removed from zoos. How that will affect younger people who form liking or disliking of, of animals 
is unclear. So again, you know, it's possible to draw attention to almost anything, including the fate of the vultures in India, um, or uh, the the fate of elephants in Africa, or any number of other such uh, things. Uh, for example, orcas in the Puget Sound, and so on and so forth. And as you may know, as humans increase in numbers, uh, all sorts of animals and all sorts of natural phenomena are in danger of being sharply altered uh, or going out of existence in the case of these animals. Um, you know, what can be done about it is, is not at all clear. And just to go back to India um, for a moment, let me remind you that uh, uh, there's the province of Kashmir, which is, um, I guess it's not considered a province, but a state in India, but it's highly contested because the majority population is Muslim and the rulers, of course, are Hindu. And uh, the current premier, Modi, um, cracked down very severely on Kashmir and any sort of self-rule and anything like that. Um, to the detriment of the local population to a tremendous extent. And there's been some opposition to that in this country, but not really terribly much. So on the one hand, somebody might get us worried about um, vultures, but we're not necessarily worried about people to the same extent uh, in certain places. So we have a lot to worry about that we don't. Well, I have a maybe a, a, a question. What is the future? We've talked about how we got to this point. Uh, Michael, what do you see? What will it look like 10 years from now on attention span effect by the internet? Um, that's a very good question. I mean, my guess is uh, not necessarily particularly better than yours, but uh, I would think that one thing that might happen is that as people have become more used to uh, all these social media, they, uh, they learn how to navigate them in less extreme ways. Um, and to some extent may learn how to uh, produce more positive outcomes uh, <laughs> excuse me, such as the uh, Me Too movement that I, that I, I think has, has been really, um, really effective at, at not necessarily in changing how people behave, but at least in alerting them to a kind of behavior that otherwise went under the cover, so to speak, or under cover. But um, I do think that some people will become more outspoken about being mistreated and, and we do see that happening. And um, I also think that if we become more sophisticated about the use of these media, which seems possible, uh, it will be harder for the truly crude hate to, to come through. Um, at the same time, I suspect uh, there will be further advances in many of these media that will make it even easier to put out certain kinds of messages that are highly undesirable. So um, I don't know where the balance will lie. So the millennials may save us yet? They may. I mean, if you look at... Um, you know, the supporters of Donald Trump, if you consider that some sort of canary in the coal mine, they're mostly our age or, or a little bit younger than we are, um, but not, a, not in their 20s or 30s. So I think there's a possibility of, of better outcomes. Um, but, you know, I certainly don't have a clear crystal ball despite the fact that I got some publicity because I supposedly 
predicted a lot of what we're seeing now back in the 90s uh, before there were these social media. Um, so, um, you know, I wish I had more confidence in my own predictive powers, but I don't. But the media is only going to get all the more widespread means of faster internet service, 5G, fiber. Yeah, I think there's almost a limit as to how fast it could be. I mean, um, you know, things seem to be pretty clear now. I mean, at least as I look at uh, the, um, I guess, nine of you, if I'm counting right, um, oh, 10, I think. Um, you know, I see you all very clearly. I can hear you clearly. The, it isn't clear how that sort of technology can get much better. Uh, but obviously, you know, they will come in still higher resolution and perhaps 3D and this and that. Um, they will certainly keep trying for more, uh, but there may be a limit just as in a certain sense, you could say, uh, print reached its limit a fairly long time ago and uh, we're not enabled to read 15 books an hour uh, today, um, even though um, there's much more to read and so forth. So whether there will be tremendously different things now in the future is unclear. Uh, some people have argued that the, let me say a little bit about so-called big tech. Um, what is called big tech, which includes companies like Apple and Google and Facebook and Twitter and, and I don't know exactly who else. Um, these companies are basically not technology companies in my way of thinking of it. They're much more explicitly attention channels. Um, even something like Amazon, which started out after all selling books uh, and now provides movies and, and all sorts of things like that. It's fundamentally a way of tra transferring attention and uh, they all work in that way. But what has been pointed out and there's a good deal of argument that they've grown too big is that these giant companies are right now preventing new developments from coming about because they are all so big. And they're going to fight very hard to stay big. Um, and that will mean that in some ways there may be less uh, inventiveness um, in, in such social media. And also it's not clear, at least to me, what that greater inventiveness would be that would, would mean a lot. For example, uh, one thing that we don't have on our own computers at this point is so-called virtual reality where we could see in 3D. Well, people have claimed that is coming for a long time now. Um, but it hasn't. And my guess is that it doesn't really add enough to make it worthwhile. Maybe the reason it isn't coming any faster. Um, you know, if, if you, many people during this pandemic have ordered food in and so forth, if the food could just pop out of your computer, that would be very nice, but that's not going to happen. Um, so uh, exactly what kinds of changes will really be of value to most people is not the same as what might be invented. Uh, and, and so it's very hard to say what changes will occur. Audra? You know, I don't know anything about Facebook or um, Twitter or those um, mass media things. But I was talking to somebody who seemed to know a lot about them. And he said that they have mechanisms for magnifying certain uh, tweets or comments that if they detect that someone put out a tweet and got a lot of responses, that they can then put that on the list of what you should look at this week and that goes out to a lot of people. And so this just magnifies 
the number of people who are exposed to this tweet or this Facebook comment, and then it gets to be to snowball in that way. And so they can control to a certain extent the amount of exposure that one tweet or one Facebook comment could get. And um, they, I think their, their algorithm just deals with the number of people who've already looked at it. Well, I think their algorithms are actually more complicated than that, but yes, basically that's what I was trying to explain, that they have reasons to want certain uh, things to get magnified because, only because in some ways that aids their ability to uh, convince advertisers to advertise. Uh, so it's a, it's a more complicated reason than, than what you've just laid out, but it nonetheless does work in that way. Um, yes, so, so that's true. I'll just say that. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. They have got a motive. <laughs> We talked about internet speed in, in, in your last answer to me, but there's also going to be a question of availability. I believe it's Elon Musk that is talking about sending up a number of satellites to make internet available worldwide at all times to anybody who has you know, an appropriate device. Do you, you see some kind of worldwide impact from that? Well, it is already a way to block it out. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is already pretty worldwide, unfortunately, in some cases. Uh, but you know, it is true that uh, it's not universal. For example, even in this country, there are plenty of areas that do not have high-speed internet. And right. one of the things uh, Biden has called for is increasing the amount of access to to uh, the internet. For example, during the pandemic, uh, many school children did not have access to uh, the internet or computers or anything at home. And so they were at a tremendous disadvantage. Um, so getting it out there more is a good thing. Elon Musk's method of doing it with, I think, something like 13,000 satellites or maybe even more. Uh, which he definitely can do is, you know, something that worries a lot of people who like looking at stars and so forth, uh, because they will be increasingly invisible um, behind all that. Um, and, you know, just tremendously increasing the amount of space junk and so forth. But um, I do think that, uh, making the internet more universally available on the whole is to be desired because there are many positive things that people can do with it. But I think at the same time, you have to look at the negatives of all that. Um, people, I mean, one of the things that is happening increasingly in this country is uh, that um, people become victims of, of cyber crimes of one sort or another and uh, uh, are forced, for example, to pay ransom. There's something called ransomware um, that uh, apparently this company in Russia now sells ransomware to whoever wants to buy it. That's not exactly related to attention, but um, it does show that we live in a world that is increasingly interconnected. And if that interconnection is more fair, that might be better. On the other hand, I don't know how many emails you get from Nigeria telling you that you have just inherited $4 million or whatever. Um, the number of people who fall for those might be quite small, but occasionally somebody completely loses their possessions as a result of that. So, um, Certainly, as it gets wider, we will expect more in the way of more subtle and different sorts of cybercrime as well as everything else. Um, and we don't really know how to handle that. So 
So, so as a follow-up question to that, as you go to sleep tonight, uh, what worries you the most? What do you think about in this context? Well, I don't know that I aligned by thinking about it, but, um, <laughs> um, you know, I mean, in a way, what worries me the most on a day-to-day -day basis right now is the fact that um, things are happening around the country that, first of all, there are something like 15% of the population really believe that Trump won, and that's partly due to the internet. Um, and uh, to, through his use of, of Twitter and so forth, basically saying that, uh, you know, it, it was fraud. He predicted the fraud long in advance. But now you have all these uh, Republican controlled states um, trying very hard to limit voting in every way they can think of. And uh, so I see our democracy very much endangered. I, it doesn't all have to do with the attention economy, but considerable amount of it does because it has pulled people together in places like Montana and so forth that were much more centrist before or even progressive in some cases um, and pulled them pretty far to the right in their views of the world uh, through complicated chains of, of developments. But um, as, as I recently saw on Facebook actually, um, there was a, a map showing LA in blue and um, seven states in purple is pointing out those seven states with 14 senators have the same population as Los Angeles. And uh, so we're becoming less and less capable of being democratic if those states can be influenced in the way they are being influenced right now. So I do think that any meaningful democracy is in considerable danger, but the solution to that might be just more savvy younger people, but, but unfortunately they tend not to want to stay in those states. So, so that's a problem. I would say that's what I fall asleep worrying about more. Do we have any more questions uh, for Michael? Well, well, thank you for listening. Yeah. It's been a pleasure um, trying to answer your questions and uh, I hope you got something out of it. So thank you. No, thank you, Michael. Again, we really enjoyed it. And for your very candid remarks, both on the internet world and in the political world too. Uh, please keep doing what you're doing in the future. And thank you again for coming. Thank you. Take care. All thank of you. you. Bye-bye.